Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're happy to be with you. Hello, uh, brother Al. Happy great, to great to be here. Uh, we're happy to have you. Thank you, brother Frank. Brother Alex, how, how you doing? Are you? Good brother to see Al. you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And yeah, we're happy to be with you. Happy Sunday. And uh, uh, today we have a special, special guest. I'm very excited. I met uh, uh, brother Al maybe a year and a half ago. Maybe a year, was it last? Do you at, remember? At the Bible study. Where? When? Uh, when? I know where. Yeah, but when? Um, about a year ago. About a year ago. Yes. About a year ago in Naples, Florida. And I was very impressed uh, by his story. And you're going to be really impressed and uh, can't wait to hear it. Um, so, uh, Big Al, because you're called Big Al. So, you have a great story. Can you tell us a little bit uh, where you're from and uh, a little bit about your childhood and where you grew up? And Sure. Um, right now, I live in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. And uh, my childhood was kind of unique. Um, when I was born, uh, the father who I thought I was supposed to have left when I was two weeks old. Never met him, never saw him. And uh, my brother took over as my father figure mm -hmm. and he used to carry, carry me around wherever he went. He would just carry me because he was so proud to have a little brother. Many years later though, um, uh, probably about 15, 20 years ago, my aunt told me that, uh, do you want to see a picture of your father? So I said, yes. So she showed me a picture. He says, his name is Al Williams. See, what happened was my mother must have had an affair. And that's where I came from. And the guy that was supposed to be my father found out and that's why he left. Um, my name is Alfred William Zolak. So then that made sense with the Al Williams. Mm -hmm. And I uh, did that Ancestry.com thing, and the first name that pops up on my list is an Albert Williams. And uh, my wife says, are you going to contact him? I said, no. I said, if he wanted to be in my life, he would have been. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put any surprises on his family. I don't want to you know, come up, knock on the door and say, hi, guess who I am? Because I don't want to hurt anyone. Right. You know, and the only thing he would be to me is really just really nothing. You know, just another person I met like on the street. Um, we, my mother got remarried. We had, uh, he, my stepfather had four kids and my mother had me and my brother Joe. And it was like the Brady Bunch, two families brought together. And I, I had a good relationship with my stepfather. He worked very hard. He was hardly ever around because he was working so much to, put a roof over our head, food in our mouth, mouth and clothes on our back. And, uh, you know, so I uh, started playing basketball and I started playing in about the fourth grade. And um, it's funny how my mother found out because I was in the Cub Scouts and my mother wanted me to go on to the Boy Scouts. So I would have Boy Scout meetings and instead of, uh, I would get dressed in my Boy Scout outfit, but under it I would put shorts and my basketball stuff. And instead of going to the meeting, I would go play basketball. And she saw my name in the paper one day and she found out and you know, she questioned me on it. And I said, mom, I don't want to be a boy scout. I want to play basketball. So I started playing basketball when I was in, uh, about four years old. I was never any good. Uh, my freshman year in high school, the coach kept me around because it was funny. My sophomore year I was 17th man on a basketball team, which means you never play. My junior year, I dressed varsity and I played two quarters JV. Then my senior year, I became the star of the team because I didn't give up. When everybody else was going swimming and going out with their girlfriends, I was working out, uh, running steps to get bigger and stronger and better. And that paid off because you know what? Success comes before work, only in the dictionary. In order to become successful, you got to work first. And how hard you work is going to determine how successful you are in everything you do in life. That's so, so you were very dedicated. Uh, your story is very similar to mine, uh, except uh, I never became a professional soccer player, but soccer was my life yes. growing, uh, growing up in Europe. I was not into school, I was not into anything really. Uh, that was my, I didn't have God in my life, so soccer was my religion. And uh, I, if I could play 24-7, I could have played 24-7. So, uh, but uh, so I can relate to, to your passion yeah. for basketball. And, then, and, passion. and by doing that, that enabled me to go into a college. I went on to a junior college, played basketball there where we were third in the East in junior colleges up in New Jersey. 
And then I transferred to a four-year school where we uh, went to the national championships in Kansas City, Missouri for two years. Um, after that, I got a trial to play in the minor leagues of the NBA, mm -hmm. and I made it to the last cut. Mm -hmm. And then I um, hooked up with the Harlem Globetrotters playing on the Washington Generals, their opposition team. And I traveled around the world with the world-famous Harlem Globetrotters. I love Harlem Globetrotters. And uh, I got a chance to, to see them live. And I, I was laughing, I think my, my mouth, my jaw was hurting from laughing because it, it was hilarious, you know. It was, it was a great experience. I, I call it my million dollar experience without the million. We didn't make much money, yeah. but uh, uh, it was run, run very professionally. We weren't allowed to associate with them off the court. Mm -hmm. We traveled in a little 15 passenger van. They okay. traveled in a big bus and uh, we were squeezed in there like sardines. And we stayed at the real cheap hotels. They stayed at the Hilton's and the Holiday Inn's. And, uh, you know, in, in New York, for example, we played in front of 88,000 people in one weekend. Uh, wherever we went, seven nights a week throughout the United States and Canada. April 16th, we flew to Copenhagen. We were in Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, Italy, and England. And everywhere we went, we sold out. In England, we uh, played at Wembley for 12 straight nights. And we had like 18,000 people a night. Oh, yeah, it was, it was a very big, big back then. It's, uh, I played with Meadowark Lemon and Curly Neal. They were the big stars. That's awesome. Yeah, they were great. So you, you did that from what age, age to, to what age? Well, I did that in 1974-75 uh, when, when I was playing with them. And I was about 20, 24, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I gave up the Globetrotter thing to go over to Europe and play professionally. They were going to start a new basketball league in Europe. It was going to be, be like the NBA in, in America. But each country was going to have a team. Okay. Uh, so a week before the tryouts, they canceled the tryouts and they held a draft. And I went to a real small school, Glassboro State, New Jersey, so I didn't get drafted. So then I started working um, down in the Seashore Resort area in Wildwood, New Jersey, which is like right next to Atlantic City. Uh, I would work there during the summer times, and then I would come down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and work over there uh, during the winters. So I'd go back and forth, back and forth. Were you a believer growing up? No, you know, you know, I, it's kind of funny because I always saw this little pillow mm -hmm. on our sofa. And it was like, God grant me this serenity mm -hmm. to accept the things I cannot change, mm -hmm. the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I never really understood it way back then, but I remember always seeing that. My mother always had that out. Um, I had the little old lady next door take me to church. Uh, the, my neighbor take me to church a couple times, you know, and uh, um, my parents weren't really, you know, churchgoers. And um, I really didn't uh, have, I believe in God, but I really didn't have God in my life. No, not, not, not at all. So what happened? Yeah. Well, what happened was um, after my basketball career, I used to, like I told you, I worked in Wildwood during the summer and Fort Lauderdale during the winters. Well, when I was 27 years old, I was living in Florida. And I got a telephone call that changed my whole life as it is today. I picked up the telephone and the person on the other end of the line said to me, your mother's dead. When I got this phone call, I felt these feelings, I felt these emotions, and I felt this pain that I never felt before in my life. I had to go up to New Jersey and go to the viewing of my best friend, my mother. After her funeral, there was something different in my life because I came back down to Florida with these feelings, with these emotions, with this pain, with this emptiness in my heart, knots in my stomach, all because I lost my best friend, my mom. When I came down to Florida at that time, I went over to one of my so-called friend's houses and my friend said, here, Big Al, try some of this. He said, this will help you ease the pain for a couple weeks, help you escape reality for a couple weeks. And I said, well, what is it? He says, it's something called cocaine. Now, I never even heard of it. This is 1979. That's how straight I was. I never even heard of it, but my friend told me it would help me. So I said, okay, I'll try it. And that was the biggest mistake I ever made in my life because my friend lied because my two week escape turned into seven years of living hell. Seven years where I stole, stole free because it was given to me by a so-called friend. Then I realized you had to buy it. Then I realized how expensive it was. And then I myself turned into a big time drug dealer where my own personal habit grew from being free to up to $1,000 a day at times. Now $1,000 a day, needless to say, I am lucky to be alive or better yet, I like to say, somebody up there must really love me. The cocaine destroyed my life. It raped me of everything I had physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. 
It destroyed my life. It took everything from me except for my life. And the funny part about that is, I don't know when or if we'll do it will do that because I can't see the damage that I've done to the inside of my, my body. We can't see inside of ourselves. It all started out for that party on Friday and Saturday nights, like it starts out for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. My Friday turned into Saturday, my Saturday turned into Sunday, my Sunday turned into Monday, and then before I knew it, I was only drinking and drugging on days to start with the letter T. Tuesday and Thursday, hmm, I wish, because it became today and tomorrow. I lived to use and I used to live, I was drinking and drugging every day. I mean, I lived in a house with all of my shades pulled down during the daytimes because I would be constantly peeking out of my windows because I thought there was somebody out there chasing me. There was nobody out there chasing me, of course. But these were the beginning stages of, of the paranoia that was setting in on my life. I wouldn't fall asleep at nights, I'd pass out. I wouldn't wake up in the morning, I would come too. If I had to brush my teeth, I had to do a line with cocaine just to get the energy to get out of my bedroom, to get to my bathroom and brush my teeth. I was sick. I didn't care about you, but more important, I didn't care about myself because I, I love getting high and I love, love getting drunk. You know, it was just, it was just, it was just totally, totally destroyed me. And, uh, you know, so that's basically what happened there. But I don't want to get into all my horror stories, but what I do want to say is during my last two years of my addiction, the drugs actually paralyzed me for a month and a half. Wow. I couldn't walk. Now you would think that that would straighten me out for a month and a half, and it did because I couldn't get out of my house and get my drugs, and none of my so-called friends were delivering. Where were my friends when I was paralyzed? They were over somebody else's house whooshing for free. Mm -hmm. They didn't care if I lived or died, but they, I thought they were my boys, my girls, whatever you want to call these people. You see, I used to have a lot of money, I used to have a lot of drugs, and I used to have a lot of friends. At the end of my seven-year addiction, I ran out of money, I ran out of drugs, and I ran out of friends. Mm -hmm. I was about ready to be tossed out into the gutter and no place to live, nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep. And that's when I said to myself, I better get a job. When I was drinking and drugging, I couldn't hold a job because at six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning when everybody else is getting up to go to work, I was always still trying to fall asleep mm -hmm. because I was either drunk or high all night. Mm -hmm. But a funny thing happened to me since I stopped drinking and drugging. I was able to get a job and hold on to it for once, which enabled me to have a roof over my head, food in my mouth, clothes on my back, and things started going better for me since I stopped drinking and drugging. I even met this beautiful young lady one day and I got engaged. Now since all these wonderful things were happening to me, I came up with this brilliant idea. I said, Al, you can go back out through drugs, just on Fridays, mess, mess around with the drugs instead of my girlfriend. Well, until one day I walked into my apartment and this young lady had a surprise waiting for me. She was sitting on my sofa, crying her eyes out like a baby, with my ring in her hand. And when I walked into the apartment that day, she said, here pal, here's your ring back, get out of my life. She said, I'm sick and tired of watching you destroy yourself. She said, I'm sick and tired of watching you kill yourself, and I'm not gonna let you destroy and kill me. When this young lady threw me out of her life that day, I finally realized that me, this big bad macho guy that I thought it was, that I had a problem. Three days later, I went over to an older woman's house, crying like a baby. And I said to this lady, I said, I've got a drug problem. This woman didn't give me a big lecture. She didn't scream and yell at me. She said to me, she said, that's okay. She reached out and she gave me a hug and took me for help. That's where my uh, motivational speaking comes from my program is called Do Hugs Not Drugs because I never heard of anyone dying from a hug, but I sure have uh, from from drugs. So I, I mean, it's just uh, um, that that's that that's what basically happened to me, and um, you know I didn't have God in my life um, when I gave up the drugs during my first two years. There was something missing in my life, mm -hmm. and I couldn't put my finger on it. And then uh, I met these two young ladies by our swimming pool and they were sitting there reading something. And I said, can I sit down with you? They said, yeah. I said, yeah, okay, pretty girls. I said, what are you reading? They said, the Bible. I said, oh, because I didn't want to hear that guy. So. so I sat there and I suffered, okay? Every time I would see them after that, they would invite me to their church. It got to the point when I saw them coming, I turned around and went the other way because I didn't want to hear it. 
until January 29th, 1989, I woke up that Sunday morning and I said, let me go to that church. I went to that church and they had a guest speaker, his name was Jeff Fenholt, who used to be a singer with Black Sabbath, which is a real heavy rock and roll band from years ago. And he was giving his testimony, and I'm in this packed auditorium of about a thousand people, and I'm standing in the back. At the end of his uh, speech, he wants to have an altar call, call people up to see if they want to accept the Lord. I feel this little tugging at my heart, and I said to myself, uh, you know, what are these people going to think if I walk up there? And then after a couple minutes, I felt that tugging again, and I said, you know what, I don't care what these people think. And I walked up there, broke down crying, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior, and my life has never been the same since. Now, what I want to tell people is this. No lightning bolt came down from heaven and struck me. No earth-shattering things happened. Nothing like that. But I'll tell you what did happen. I felt something that I never felt before in my life. And that was something called inner peace. Mm -hmm. I never felt that before. And, I, and, and, and that's what I felt when I accepted, accepted the Lord. You know, and I try to tell people too, hey, listen, just because you accept the Lord and become a Christian, your life's not gonna be perfect. Right. You know, you're still gonna have issues. You're still gonna get flat tires. You're still gonna have things happen in your life. You know, but the biggest thing that I learned was that I had somebody to turn it over to, Amen. my Lord and Savior. You know, and sometimes it would take me a while to turn it over because as soon as my life starts falling apart, the quicker I got back to Jesus, the quicker I got back to the Lord, the better my life became. So over a period of time, I learned to turn things over quickly. So, so I, I, I don't, uh, you know, something like that. Um, what I want to talk about too is, is if I can, is. Uh, I wanted to title, entitle this Back to Basics, mm -hmm. okay? When I say that word basics, B-A-S-I-C-S, -S, it stands for something. It stands for brothers and sisters in Christ, sincerely. Mm -hmm. And I throw that word sincerely in there um, because I think sometimes as Christians, um, we, we become full of ourselves, okay? We tend to forget all the trials and tribulations that we went through to get where we are today. Yes. We don't uh, provide the comfort, we don't provide the love to other people like we should be doing. And the, the message that I really want to get across is, you know, I hope I can give you some encouragement, Amen. give you some hope, because hope does not fail, Amen. and inspire you, whoever is watching, to never, ever give up. Now, when I say that, though, I don't mean at your job, just never give up. I don't mean with your family, never give up. I don't mean with the worldly things, never give up. What I'm talking about is your life. Because over the last couple years, with everything that's been going on in America, the actual drug usage and alcohol usage has been through the roof, and the people are becoming addicted and addicted more than ever before. Um, depression is running rampant among people, young kids, and adults. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is running rampant. And also, suicide. So many kids and adults have tried to commit suicide, and so many adults have actually uh, been successful in doing it. Mm -hmm. The question I like to say is, what is suicide? Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, mm -hmm. okay? Who is it that makes you feel like you don't wanna live? It's other people, mm -hmm. yeah. how other people treat you, what other people do to you, what other people say about you, makes you sometimes feel like you don't want to live. Mm -hmm. How do you get even with these other people? You live. You let them know that you're going to be around as long as possible to really make their lives miserable. You don't hurt yourselves. You know, because all these things that we're going through is just, just for the moment. And you know, I, I told you, um, you know, uh, a little bit about myself, you know, former pro basketball player, the do hugs, not drugs thing. And uh, I, I was a drug counselor in a high school for 16 years. I was a health and physical education teacher. But the reason I told you my story earlier is because you have to know where I've been so that you can know how God has blessed me in my life. 
You know, it wasn't easy. I, I, went, I went through a lot. My niece died from a drug overdose. I've been to funerals of kids 10, 11, 12, 13 years old because, because of drugs. And, and you know, it's just, uh, it's just so many things that, uh, that are going on in today's world that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not really a happy place now. But, 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 if you make that decision, that choice, to let Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, then things might be different. They will be different, as a matter of fact, and I, and I, and I know that uh, if, if God can do these things for a wretch like me, Amen. just think what he can do for some of you out there. Amen. Now, John 3.16. Can I, am I getting too long-winded or no? No, okay, no, okay. no, keep going, keep going. Okay. I love it. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. That is the most well-known Bible verse in the world. But when something is so well-known, it loses its effect yeah. and it loses its meaning. John 3, 16, what we do. Well, I want to personalize this Bible verse, if I may. I'm not trying to compare myself to God, but just to know what an awesome God we serve. I got married to the same girl who threw me out of her life. It took me three years to get her back, but I had to get my, myself back first. We got married and my wife got pregnant. I did a lot of praying and a lot of crying, hoping and pleading that my previous drug usage wasn't gonna affect our future child. On August the 7th at 6.49 one year, my wife and I had a beautiful baby girl. 6.49 in the morning. I get up and I go home to get some sleep. Before my head could hit the pillow, my telephone rang again. It was my wife on the other end of the line screaming and crying that there's something wrong with our baby. When I hung up the phone that morning, I started to cry my heart out. And as I'm walking away from that phone crying, I stopped. I looked up to God and I said, aha, you're testing me. I said, I trust in you, dear Lord. Your will will be done. And I walked away from that phone laughing. If somebody would have seen me, they would have thought that I was crazy. Our daughter was born with something called SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, sleep apnea, whatever. Mm -hmm. She had to be hooked up to a monitor. And for the first eight weeks, that buzzer went off about six, seven times a night, mm -hmm. which means you gotta get up, run to that crib. You don't know if you're gonna find a breathing baby or not breathing baby, and that was very, very painful. Seven years later, we have our second daughter on December 19th. On December 29th, me and my wife and the little babies in a bassinet were watching TV about 1.30 in the morning. I looked down at the little baby and I see milk coming out of her mouth. So I went out to the kitchen, got a towel, came in and wiped the milk off. Next thing I know is she's turning purple, okay? My wife gets up, runs to the phone, dials 911, hurry, hurry, please get here, please get here. I picked up her little baby out of that bassinet turning purple, and as I lifted her out of that little bassinet, stuff started coming out of her nose and her mouth, and she was dying in my hands. She was dying in my hands, turning purple. What I did was I held her up to the Lord. I said, please God, if you need someone, take, take me, not her. You know, but she was dying in my hands. She was born with reflux and we didn't know it. We got her to the hospital and you know, every, everything, every, everything uh, turned out fine. Also, I sit here in front of you. I said, you know, I'm 71 years old. I'm closer to the end than I am to the beginning. Well, 30 years ago, I found out that I had extensive heart disease as a direct result of the drugs that I did. They put three stents in my heart to keep me alive. And that is what is uh, uh, keeping me alive right now. And uh, what I've learned is this, no matter what we're going through, God is our comforter, Amen. okay? Uh, he comforts through his presence. It's God's nature to be with us and give us comfort when we are mourning, uh, brokenhearted, overwhelmed, worried, or sick. But, you know, we must acknowledge his presence and accept his comfort. 
He comforts us through his word, the Bible. He comforts us through our prayers. He comforts us through our godly friends. So today, look for those who provide comfort and practice comforting others. The distance between heaven and hell is 12 inches. That's the distance between your mouth and your heart. Confess by thy mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus had risen from the dead and you will be saved. Amen. No, no doubt about that at all. It says right in Romans 10, 9, 10, confess by thy mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus, you know, uh, you, you will be saved. Um, what a gift. Eternal life and it's free. And what I want to do is I, I like to knock and ask people, what do you think that is? Well, what that is right now for those of you that are watching is this opportunity knocking. For those of you who may not have made that decision to accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior, I would like to give you an opportunity to do so, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay? For those of you at home, please just bow your head and just repeat these simple words. Keep your wallets in your pocket. This doesn't cost a penny. The only way to get to heaven is through his son. The only way to get to the Father is through his son. Amen. So bow your head and just say this, please, with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to shed his blood on that cross for my sins, past, present, and future. Come into my heart, come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. In your precious name, I pray, amen. Amen. I'm not just gonna leave you hanging with just saying that, you know, and then, well, what do I do now? You know, well, what I want you to do now, for those of you who prayed with me, is find yourself a church that you feel comfortable in so you can grow and be fed constantly. I accepted the Lord 13 straight weeks in a row. You don't have to do that. I didn't know that. Though, mm -hmm. Because I said to myself, I never got anything right in my life, and I want to make sure I got this right. Mm -hmm. But as I got more educated, I know you do it once. You know, that's why you have to do, do it once. You are still going to have trials. You're still going to have issues. You're still going to have things that are happening in your life. But remember, now you have someone to turn all those things over to. I told you about my mother. When my mother died, I turned to drugs. When both my kids almost died at birth, I turned to the Lord. You know, and, and today I'm blessed because the first daughter that was born with the sudden infant death syndrome is 31 years old now and gave us two beautiful grandchildren, five-year-old Caroline and a year and a half-year-old Asher, a boy. And my other daughter now, Olivia, is in Nashville, Tennessee. And the best thing is they both love the Lord. And that is, you know, something that I'm, I'm you know, I'm so proud of. And my, my wife had a, 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 a big, um, big part in it because I was like the disciplinarian. Uh, I, I was like the bad guy. But I, I, I want to do this little demonstration, you know, and I, and I could do this, you know, that maybe some people can relate to this. Everybody can relate to money, right? So if I had this $20 bill, which I do, and I want to ask you, I'll ask you, would you want this? Sure. If I was going to give it to you? Sure. sure. Now, why would you want this? Because it's free. Okay, because it's free. And it has value. Oh, oh uh, there it is. It has value. Yeah. You know, now, if I were to go like this, would you still want it? Yes. Okay, if I were to drop it on the floor, kick it, and step on it, would you still want it? Yes. Why? Because, because it still has value. Because it has value. It still has value. You know, see, this can be some of your lives that you've been kicked, you've been spit on, you've been told, I wish I never had you, you've been told that, you know, you're no good, you've been told all these different things, but you're just like this $20 bill, you have value. And the thing that I want to tell you is, you were born with value and purpose, Amen. okay? Your life has promise and potential as it unfolds in accordance to God's eternal plan. Amen. God doesn't make junk. You know, may God wrap his loving arms around you and, his fa and your family, you know, and, and just, I would hope that you would give, 
give the Lord a chance. It was the best decision that I ever made in my life. And I know I'm not afraid to die, even though I'm closer to the end than I am to the beginning, mm -hmm. because I know where I'm going. Do you? A guy told me years ago when I used to go to some meetings, it's better to pray to God and find out that there isn't one than not to pray and find out that there is. Mm -hmm. There is a God, there is a Lord, and he's just waiting for you. Open the door. Amen. Thank you, brother. That was very, very powerful. Um, when I think of your testimony, you know, it's only in the Christian faith that God will take a mess and make a, a message. Take, you know, and uh, um, take it, somebody who is, has gone through a test and make it a testimony, right? So, in, in you know, the Bible, you read of the thief on the cross, right? Yep. He, he had a ter terrible life, but God was patient with him and he turned to the Lord and it's never too late. And I love the verse in the Bible where Paul, I think it's Romans 5, 20, where it says that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the, the, the deeper we get into sin and into being lost, the more we turn to God, the more we can appreciate His grace because the more we've been forgiven, right? And when I look at your life and people who have gone through drugs and, and have gone through chaos in their lives, uh, like me too, um, it, it, you, know, you, you get to appreciate even more the grace that God offers, right? Yeah, you know, we, we were out in Nashville, Tennessee, visiting my daughter, mm -hmm. and I want to encourage you, everyone, to start talking to people. Don't be afraid to talk to others, okay? Because we're walking down the street, me, my wife, and my daughter, and they're like window shopping and whatever, and we walk past this church, and on the bench in front of a church is a homeless guy, mm -hmm. okay? And I say, I had a sign, homeless and all, and I said, hi, how you doing? This is fine, and we kept on walking. And I stopped about 100 feet down and I said my, uh, to my wife, honey, I gotta go back and talk to this guy. You continue your window shopping. So I went back, I sat down, and I started talking to this man, and he's a Christian, okay? And we were talking and talking, and uh, he says, Al, I says, you know, every, every Sunday I sit out in front of this church, not one person that comes out of that church says one word to me. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a disgrace. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there, and, uh, you know, we're talking, and, and I said to him, I said, you know, I speak in churches. He said, well, I go to a few churches. Do you have any? I said, yeah, I gave him one of my cards. It says, do hugs, not drugs on it. So the guy says, this would make a good T-shirt. I said, really? I had a jacket on. I took my jacket off, and I had one of my do hugs, not drugs T-shirts on. I took the shirt right off my back, and I gave it to the guy, and he was so happy. You know, and I went back to talk to the guy, thinking that what I could do for him, it's not what I did for him, it's what he did for me. And he told me this story. He said, two years ago, we had a tornado here. Mm -hmm. The house that I was living in, the roof was sucked off. Everything in my living room was being sucked out of the house, and I was laying on the floor. And I'm looking up saying, I guess this is it. All of a sudden, he said, I felt something like a foot on my chest. I was the only thing that did not fly out of that house. He says, I believe it was the Lord put his foot on me to save me. And, and, and uh, you know, what a powerful story that is. And, and, and uh, you know, I mean, for, you know, we, my wife and I, we always put like uh, protein bars in our, in our pocketbooks and all. So whenever we pull up, we don't give them money because we don't know what they're going to do with right. it. Okay. We'll give them a protein bar. We'll give them some food uh, so, or offer to take them to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll do something like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, if, if not by the grace of God, Amen. you know, that would be that could be me very easily. And we are all one accident away from being homeless or whatever. Absolutely. You know, so let's start talking to people. You know, I know some people are afraid to talk to people in wheelchairs. They, you're not gonna catch it, okay? What you gotta do is talk, you know, these people have hearts, feelings, emotions, you know, and pain. You know, we, we have to talk to people and show God's love. And that's how people, the greatest compliment I got was in a high school meeting one time and, uh, and uh, one of the teachers uh, cursed. And the other teacher said, you can't say that. And the guy said, why not? He says, well, Big Al's here. And that's how I knew that I was making a difference because people knew that I was different mm -hmm. because of the way I acted. And, the way, and, you know, and, and, and don't be afraid, afraid to, to say that word, Jesus. You know? And I want to challenge all these Christians out here and the people that are listening. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? You invited somebody over your house, 
to watch this program. You know, have some food there. Invite you. Know, are you afraid? You're afraid how people are going to react. You can't be afraid. What to 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 introduce them to the to the greatest thing in the world, Amen. our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. When was the last time you mentioned the word or even said the word Jesus to somebody? Again, people are afraid to say that. We don't want to offend anybody. You can't worry about offending people. You can't worry about offending people. And for those of us that are Christians, listen, it's not just the pastor's job to lead people to the Lord. We should be leading people to the Lord and talking about Him. That's what we should be doing. But, you know, do we do that? Are we afraid of what people are going to say? Are we afraid of how people are going to think of us? I'm not ashamed to, 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 to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And we have too many closet Christians. Mm -hmm. That's right. and, uh, and I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. It's people that are Christians when it's only convenient for them. I liked what Alex said when he spoke the other day. CEOs. We got a lot of CEOs. That means Christmas and Easter only. Okay, you know, do, do, do we only call on God during Christmas and Easter? And I'm going to finish with this one thing. If this is a question that I want to maybe food for thought. Is this Satan's way of taking our focus off the real reason for the season right. by making it about gifts mm -hmm. and presents? That's me, right? Yeah. And think about that. S-A-N-T-A? S-A-T-A-N? Mm -hmm. Could that be just food for thought? Yeah, thank you. Thank thanks, you thanks for listening. Thank you, thank you for sharing. It was <laughs> interesting. I knew that story about the homeless guy. Uh, you had yes, told me that yes. story before. I remember you telling me, but I didn't know it was in Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. And the reason I'm saying this is because we're laughing. Because the reason we have this church is because of well, six months ago, person. we met a homeless person in Nashville, Tennessee. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a picture. I'll show you a picture. <laughs> they probably not the same guy. He was in a wheelchair. And he had, in, if you go to the national newspaper, right? Uh, he was shot, you know, by a homeless guy in the head, you know. So he, he showed us he had no scalp, you know. Yeah. And uh, and his wife crossed the street and she was killed by a drunk driver. So he was homeless in the wheelchair. But he he was coming towards us. I moved out of the way. He stopped, and I honestly thought he was going to hurt me. Yeah. You know, he looked real. He looked like he was going to kill me. You know, he looked so mean and so evil. And then. I don't exactly remember what happened. We started talking to him, all that. Started praying for him, and just like that, his demeanor changed. He went from being mean and evil to being broken and crying and open, and uh, and he only had two things left in his name. And he, those two things, he took them out of the bag. One was a cross, which he gave you, and and one was his his, his wife's brooch, brooch. A rose, and he gave it to me. Wow! And he said, "I want you guys to know because I don't know how much longer we'll be. I'll be here, and so our goal is to find him. His name is Jeff in a wheelchair downtown Nashville, and he's the reason we started this church." So when you were saying the story, I, I knew the story, but I didn't know yeah. it was Nashville, Tennessee. We started laughing. And when you said, you know, uh, there are people in wheelchair, you, you know, blah, 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 you, you can, you know, you, uh, we're, we're laughing. As that's why I was laughing, because, uh, because it was a quite, uh, quite uh, not a coincidence. Oh, so, wow. Incredible, huh? God works in funny ways. Yes, so. I want to show, <laughs> show the shirt to people. I want to show your shirt to people. Sure to people. And, uh, and so it says, what does it say here? It says... Big Al says, do hugs, not drugs. Jesus in the middle. Jesus is the focus. Amen. Then on the back, it's, this search says, uh, 2020, perfect vision for the Lord. I had them printed up in 20, the year 2020. But, uh, but no matter what, 2020 is the perfect vision for the Lord. Yes. Yeah, Big Al says, do hugs, no, no drugs. And it's true, Al. And uh, you have any questions, uh, brother, or comments? Um, I don't really have any questions, but I do have a little bit of a comment. Okay. Today, all day, the scripture was stuck with me. I don't know, I've seen it maybe a week ago or something. It's the second Timothy, uh -huh. uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, For God gave us not the spirit of fear and timidity, yes. but the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Self and, yeah. you know, hearing your testimony, they just kept on coming on repeat because what you went through 
building yourself up to something great and then it's just the spirit working in you. Yeah, so that's, man. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. And it's funny because, again, the link is, I saw Ella give us a talk Thursday morning and my whole talk was on 2 Timothy 1.7. So the greatest gift you can give people, you know, the greatest gift is not money. The greatest gift is not anything else, right? The greatest gift you can give is Jesus to yes, people. Amen. And of course, you know, we still love people, give them smiles and hugs and, you know, and not drugs <laughs> and all that because we love people. But in the end, give them Jesus, you know, yes. because people, we all need Jesus. And without Jesus, uh, we are nothing. And with Jesus, we have the peace. The first same thing, when I met Jesus, when he met me, when I went to commit suicide, the first thing I felt like was peace. Mm -hmm. And I would tell people, you don't have to build my experience. You don't, I, don't have, I don't expect people to say, I believe your vision and all the things. You know, I don't expect you to believe, but you still have to explain yeah. how I went from total depression to total peace. Yeah. You still have to explain that. Yeah. How chemically, how biologically, if you don't believe in the vision, how that happened in a just a split oh, second. There, I, I guarantee there's people out there that can relate to exactly everything I said. Yes. They can relate to everything mm -hmm. you said mm -hmm. because you know there's people out there right now depressed, yes. thinking that it's the end of the world. You know, yeah. uh, you know, where's God now? You know, it's it's mm -hmm. just you know, it, believe believe me. There's a very prayer is very powerful. Yes. And I, I and also I told Christians, you know how people say, well, look, I'll pray for you. No, 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 no. Pray on the spot, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're going to get so wrapped up in your worldly day yeah. that, that you're not going to do it. I'll, I'll tell you what happened with me. Can I a minute? Yes. Okay. When I had, found out I had heart disease, they found five blockages in my arteries going to my heart. The doctor came in to me and she says, he says, I don't know what we can do for you. Okay. So anyhow, I'm in the recovery room and an orderly comes in. He says, I got to move the, remove this tube from your leg because I had a heart catheterization. He says, then I got to put pressure on your groin so you don't bleed to death. He says, is that okay? I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. He pulls it out, puts pressure on my leg. He says to me, he says, how did things go? I said, not too good. He said, do you mind if I pray over you? Mm -hmm. And he, and I start to cry and I just lost it. You see, God sent somebody into my life just when I needed it. But sometimes he sends them into your life mm -hmm. and you're not paying attention. You know, you're not paying attention. And he, that guy prayed for me, and boy, what a blessing that was. You know, there is power in prayer. Yeah. There's research that has been done in major universities yes. that uh, people that pray, mm -hmm. first of all, get sick less, less times. They have a longer lifespan. You know, so many things are so much better when you put your faith in our Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. And it doesn't, if you're a believer, it costs nothing to say, and, you know, you're going through a hard time, you have a, you're having a hard day, I know you have problems, is it okay if I pray for you? Yeah. Right there and then. It costs nothing. Most people, if they say no, they say no. But if they say yes, what a wonderful act. It's free. Yeah. And they want a wonderful act of love, you know. And, uh, and uh, so, so great, great advice. Thank you, brother. I uh, appreciate you very much. And uh, it's, you know, it's true that um, in this society, it seems like so many people, and especially our youngsters, our youth, uh, you know, they get depressed easily, and then instead of dealing with it, right, at the root of the problem, then they take, they take, you know, they take, they take, uh, they take, uh, you know, drugs or like medicine, right, mm -hmm. and then they get more depressed, you know, and then they take more drugs, and then they get more depressed, you know, it's like a cycle, right? Yes, it is. And instead of going to the Lord, and it's free with zero side effects, except the five side effects of inner peace and inner joy, yeah. and you know those are side effects, right? Hey. Which I'll take all day long. Yeah. Right? It's okay to be happy. And, <laughs> eternal, and eternal life, you know, yeah. eternal life with the Lord and, and all those things. You know, we get to things that give us uh, horrible side effects. And so thank you for sharing those things. Thank you. Maybe we'll have you again next, you know, in the winter when you come back. No problem. And maybe uh, because I, I heard you one time speak on statistics on drugs. Yeah. So well, I, left all, I left all my information. Yeah, no, no, no. I left all my no, no, information up in Jersey. No, I didn't no, know no. I was going to do this. This was like a last minute thing when he asked me. And no. he can't say no to God. No, he can't no, say no, no to God. No, no. <laughs> Everything we do is, you know, instantaneous. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because I told you when I, when I, when I, when I, when I teach and, uh, you know, I preach and teach, uh, and then we get a testimony, we get three times more views of the <laughs> testimony. So either A, my, my, my teachings stink, 
<laughs> yeah, no. Or we people like we, people like testimony. Ready, Frank? So yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you again so so much. I appreciate you I being here. Thank much. you, brother Frank. And uh, if you yeah, okay, sure, prayer, sure. Prayer. And dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that we have to get together in your name. Um, I, 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 I just hope that the people listening and watching, uh, um, it affected them in a positive way. And uh, that uh, I, I just want you to just wrap your loving arms around each and every person, their family, and protect them, dear Lord, uh, as I know that you're protecting us. I want you to wrap your loving arms around my family, wherever they may be traveling, and uh, uh, Alex's family and uh, Frank's family. And just, uh, uh, just thank you for sacrificing your son for us so that we can have eternal life when we see you. Um, thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, and thank you for this ministry here. And uh, in your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. God bless you all. And... Uh, See you soon, and uh, we hope that this message touched you as much as it touched us. God bless you. Thank you.